I'll be very brief here, Teal, so we can get started. I think you can see as well as I, the speaker and uh, and the title. Uh, Teal asked me, I don't, I don't know, a week or two ago to change to this because he's on a national committee on new guidelines and pulmonary function test interpretation and thought it was a topic um, that we should be up to date on. So thanks very much. Sorry for the delay of technical visual issues. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I thought I would um, bring the this talk on the new guidelines for pulmonary function testing, uh, just because it's relevant probably to training in particular. Um, and uh, like Ben was saying, we wrote uh, new guidelines on how to interpret pulmonary function tests. So, um, which are, I have to say, this has been an area that's been evolving over the last 10 years. And so at least, and it's something that you, even the people in pulmonary oftentimes are kind of struggling with how to use these guidelines. And so I thought this would be apropos to, to, uh, to allergy training. So I serve as a consultant just for AstraZeneca, and then uh, I have research funding extensively from NIAID and HLPI. So we're gonna try to understand how you use population-based statistics to understand pulmonary function. Um, use, use that to identify physi physiological patterns of pulmonary function. And we're gonna discuss the issue of race, which has uh, really overwhelmed many of, many of the other issues related to pulmonary function testing. Um, and so it's from this guideline, um, there's actually several people from Seattle that are here, uh, including me, but also Margaret Rosenfeld from Children's and Eric Swenson, who's over at the VA. Um, so these, this is the new technical standard for interpreting pulmonary function tests. So this is considered the, the latest um, iteration of the guidelines. And so I thought since this is sort of training, I would point out how this uh, set of guidelines have evolved. We, we initially had a, um, a guideline on how you report owner function testing, and that, that was in 2017. We then updated the guideline on how you conduct pulmonary function tests. Uh, that was in 2019, and Brian Graham was the lead on that. You might notice on the first one, it's Bruce Culver, someone who was in pulmonary medicine here for many years, that it was the lead author. And then uh, Sonia Sinodrovic was the uh, lead author on the guideline for interpretation. But part of the basis for this are the actual availability of population-based standards, because what, what the major shift is from getting a kind of rough idea of whether or not lung function is abnormal and whether or not there's obstruction, um, we actually have population norms from which you're going to generate your assessment of whether or not pulmonary function is normal or not. And the first of these was really the NHANES data, Hankinson, but really... Sorry, Dr. I think that you need to share your screen again. People aren't seeing it. Do I... Uh, I'm one of the fellows that the screen looks blank. Well, you know, it wasn't projecting when I was in, oh, I see. But I don't see that on my screen. Oh, see it now. Okay, so maybe it was just putting it out for a second. I think it's be gone again. Show. You don't have to share video. It's on now. Looks good now. All right, everybody, see it on Zoom. Let's watch Yeah, it seems like when it went to project, uh, <laughs> no, it's throughout <laughs> transcribed. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> and all the functionality. And I hope that was, I mean, that's something that. It's not. How about now? No. Oh, it came on. It came on. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Just, I'm at the limits of my knowledge. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's got some strange glitch where, where if I project, which you know, it's not project, that's like speaker mode. Yeah. Is it registering your 
Your screen is too because it's it's in your mode. You know what I mean? Yeah. Although I tried swapping the displays and it didn't work. And now I don't have to swap them back. You just share the screen in the browser. There it is. There we go. Oh, okay. So it's when you go into presenter mode that this here. Sounds like it. So this is I had to right here. Yeah. 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 Okay. If you want to try to just go from here and just click through. I know that sounds great. Okay. It's just not. Okay. Do you want to try one? Yeah. The recent update. Yeah. Always here. Never have to leave. Yeah. Is that a PowerPoint? It's kind of an old map at this point. So I don't know. <laughs> there you go. Well, and then just close out of that. Take it out of speaker view, maybe. Swap displays. Slide well, whatever works. Swap displays at the top. Yeah, I'm trying to get the window where I can swap displays and I'm not seeing it. Pretty good. Voice recognition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Video yeah. scrap and voice recognition works. <laughs> <laughs> I know the voice recognition is pretty it's spot on. Yeah, you better than dragging. I want to go like into picture view, and I don't see the options. Then all you have to do is hit that CC. You can only do that with CC. Yeah, it's pretty good. Everybody she did get the, the, on the presentation screen. yesterday screen. in an email. It's a PDF. Yeah, that. There you go. Okay. All right. I think uh, that works okay. right. What did you do? I always do. The right one. All right. Is that yeah. logged in? Right. Actually, I was just curious. Thinking, uh, has any uh, are people familiar with the guide on <laughs> Right. <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. One. Why? Well, we have a pulmonary. Yeah. 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 Um, that started with NHANES, which is primarily a Caucasian standard, and then uh, moved on to these multi-ethnic uh, standards, which have created both the ability to understand what lung function looks like across multiple ethnicities, but also created uh, quite a bit of controversy because it identified groupings uh, within that. And then, so the, that first one is just for pulmonary, for spirometry. And then that, that has subsequently been uh, extended to DLCO, carbon monoxide transfer, lung volumes. Um, there's less data in both of these. So these are both primarily calculation standards. Um, and then just most recently, there's a, um, uh, basically they use a, a method to try to create a universal race neutral standard. Um, because, uh, and, and I'll hopefully, <laughs> I think we might not have the time to really get into it too much because of the little delay here, but, um, so just to start out with population-based standards of my cartoon that says, that, uh, good news is that your cholesterol is the same, but the findings have changed. Um, that, that is actually true for some lung function tests. So as you, not because, um, not because uh, that we're interpreting it wrong, we're really becoming more accurate and that will actually change things for some people. So really most people hinged on the 2005 uh, ATS ERS standards, which use these uh, percentiles and lower limits of normal um, <laughs> to, uh, as a recommended way of, of identifying whether or not lung function is normal or not, which I'll go into in just a second. And then it actually debunked the two things that are commonly used, which is that a fixed ratio of FB1 to FBC of 0.7 is not recommended to identify airflow obstruction. And 80% predicted is not, not what you should use to identify normal. However, I would have to say generations of pulmonary fellows have basically been taught this. Um, 
And even though in the 2005 standard, this was not recommended, both of those were not recommended, they're really not widely used. And the reason for that is because the reference values that allow you to use that upper, the lower limit of normal was relatively limited back then. And the second reason was if you use the severity assessment, it's based on that percent predicted, which is different than percentile and lower limits of normal. Um, and so that creates quite a, uh, quite a challenge, I would say. But, you know, we now have those reference ranges and the new guidelines really very clearly say that you should use percentiles to identify the bounds of normal. And you shouldn't use those fixed ratios and percent predicted. Um, and then in addition to that, the assessment of severity is all based on Z-score. So Z-score percent perc percentile and lower limit or normal are related concepts. And I'll, I'll go over that just briefly because I don't think you can understand the interpretation strategy without knowing some degree of what the what those terms mean. So um, a mean value is really just the expected value. Um, uh, my, my cartoon here is telling you that statistics are a way to let you know whether or not what you're saying is correct or not. So, um, so percent of predicted is simply just a percent of the, of the mean value, the expected mean value. It doesn't tell you anything about what sort of variation you expect within your population um, and how it changes with the main predictors such as age and sex. Um, so you have this kind of range of expected values um, that in lung function is related to age, height, sex, and a number of other factors. Um, and you can describe that based on what the Z-score, which is essentially a standard deviation for a population-based statistic. So a range around the, the middle value in the percentile. So those are basically population-based statistics. So this is a, a drawing that uh, Sonia did, I guess, on a chalkboard and then took a, a picture of it about uh, the uh, distribution of values, or this is for height, you know, most men would be of, you, of kind of average height, so there's people that are tall, there's people that are uh, short um, there, and that's called a population distribution. And the thing is, is what you're trying to do with the lung function and other tests is you have the normal population distribution, and then you have a distribution also, um, in this case of the FPV1 to FPC ratio, for example, you have a different distribution of someone with disease. So like, for example, this would be a group of people with COPD. And what happens is here, there's kind of an overlap of the distribution. You have to like make and get an idea of where you're going to set that cut point of this is normal and this is not normal. Um, and so like if you do that as, for example, a 0.7, it's always in the same position, but these different reference ranges change with those factors, age in particular, but age, height, sex, and so forth. And they have different, so if you use just a single value, uh, it's not flexible to identifying differences across uh, different ranges. So the way it works here is that you have this population distribution and you have a z-score, which is essentially a standard deviation um, like you would use for just a normal statistical test, um, but it's uh, yeah, part of a regression equation. Um, everyone in, bone, in the bone density world knows all of this, right? The z-scores and t-scores, right? A t-score is essentially your best bone density when you're 20 or something like that. And a z-score is an age-adjusted bone density. And like people are very used to using that as a way to identify whether or not bone density is normal or not. Um, in this case, uh, essentially what it is, is that you have this uh, z-score of 1.6 approximately, which is down here, which gives you a, a 1 in 20 chance that a normal person, that the, the lung function is actually normal, but it's down in this range. So, and it gets increasingly uh, small as you go further out. So most likely uh, values that are out here are abnormal. Um, there's a very small chance that a normal person would be at this, at this lower range, right? And so 
This is defined in the guideline across all measurements as the lower limit of normal, the z-score corresponding to 1.6 approximately, um, and then above. And that's the, the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile. And these are all giving you the same thing. They're basically defining the norms that the vast majority of people with normal lung function adjusted for all those factors are. Um, Hasn't that always been the way we look at things, lower five and upper five are outside the normal range? The, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you should, but you, but it, until just quite recently, or I mean, I guess now about nine years ago, um, you, the only reference range that really allowed you to, to do that was NHANES, which is all, all Caucasian. So, um, but uh, the, uh, the, our, our software, for example, when I took over for as the medical director of the Montlake PFT lab, was set to a, a percentile of 2.5 over here. Um, and that's because the, in the literature, um, there's, you know, there's various ways that, that people think of these things, and maybe they think that they're different for different lung function tests and so forth. But the uh, I'm glad that you're recognizing that because the vast majority of people um, use that percent predicted, uh, which is not the percentile uh, to define the normal range. It's just widely used, and I'll tell you why that's not correct. Quick question, and you may be getting into this, but this, this seems great because it, it, it gives you the score people can fast forward to clinically and, and not have to go into the weeds. But isn't it really dependent on following standardized procedures to get the and, and, and do the algorithms in the in the software can they tell when the effort was was questionable? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So that thanks. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but the the part of the reason I was introducing that we set three different standards. One is how you report pulmonary function testing, which which has this really nice layout of essentially how you should report it in Z-scores, allowing you to look at it. The second standard, which was broken off from that original standard in 2005, went over like how to conduct the test as well as how to interpret it. We thought things were more complex and um, that there should be a separate technical standard. And that technical standard now has grading. Um, uh, there was basically a, a skeletal outline of that and how to report and then a more detailed version of that. And so the idea there is that you that the test is graded. And so you can separate the interpretation as you think it is. And then you can say, but this is like a grade D test. And so it's so like literature manuscript, you know. Yeah. Like so you, right. Because there's too many can it's trying to take out those contingencies. Because you know, if you're saying, well, the test wasn't conducted very well, and there's this, and so I'm gonna guess that the lung function is X, Y, or Z. Now it's gonna, now is that there's a very rigorous, this is the cut point, but oh, by the way, there's less certainty that that cut point, you know, that this test was conducted correctly. Yeah. So it was broken, it was broken apart in that way. But thanks for that, that question. So mean value, uh, Z score corresponding to that lower limit of normal fifth percentile upper limit of normal 95th percentile. And part of it was because in the literature, people had various thoughts like spirometry really only has a lower bound. Um, so if it's, if it's big, it's okay. Whereas if your lung volumes uh, are big, that could represent a problem, right? And so then there's an upper bound. And so some people would say, well, then we should just have 5% on either side in one case, and 2.5% and on either side if you're using both sides. Um, and so it's simplified in the new guidelines. It's always the, the fifth percentile, no matter what, what you're looking at. And so, uh, so if you look at what predicts lung function, and we'll ignore the part that there's these four groupings for a second, you know, you basically hit your maximum lung function or, you know, around 20 or so, and then lung function defines with age. Um, as it turns out, um, so that's the mean. Um, there's also this the Z score around the mean, um, as shown here, and it varies with with age. Um, and so that 
uh, in general, the, the Z scores are wider, the, the range getting you to the fifth and 95th percentile are somewhat wider uh, as you age as well. Um, and so this variation is lowest in that range around 28, uh, around 20, and then it will change uh, in both directions to having less, uh, less or sorry, more variation in each direction. That makes sense. So the 80% predict, uh, predicted rule that is widely taught as being the normal range um, is, uh, is true, but only, so this is FEV1% predicted versus the Z-score. And here's that, uh, that um, 1.6 range. Then 80% uh, predicted is in fact, uh, corresponding to that Z-score with the fifth percentile when you're 20. But then um, as you get to a different age group over here, shown here the 80 to 95, uh, you can see that that same Z-score is actually corresponding to 68% um, uh, predicted. So if you apply that rule of 80% predicted to someone in an age range outside of this younger group, then you, you no longer have a normal range, right? So if you're 20, the 80% of predicted gets you down to the lower limit of normal, and that's the origin of that. But uh, as you get to a different age, and also this is true of like changing the sex, for example, um, yeah, your percent predicted, it's not flexible to those, uh, those differences. And so you end up with a lower limit of normal that's somewhere around uh, 12 percentile. So then you're including a lot of people that have uh, probably normal lung function that are outside of the range. So just to further illustrate this, this is uh, lung FEV1 as a 20 year old going 80% down to the lower limit of normal. If you go to a, an 80 year old, you can see that the population distribution is wider. Uh, so the mean value, then you go to that uh, lower limit of normal based on the same, uh, well, the, the uh, lower limit of normal, um, same z-score, same fifth percentile, but if you do it by percent predicted, percent of predicted, a fixed value, then it's 68%, whereas, um, so it's just not flexible. And then the, the other thing, and I would say, this is why we took it off the guidelines, actually in the 2017 report, that you shouldn't use this, this metric any longer in the mid-flows. Um, which is widely used in people that are interested in airflow abstraction. <laughs> <laughs> the pediatrician, pediatric pulmonologist yeah, uh, object. Because they, they object to that. <laughs> but this will explain why that you why you shouldn't. Um, the, our transplant physicians are equally interested in this this because of the idea that it represents smaller waste disease. So. Um, the the reality is what it represents is a wider distribution. Um, so it's harder to, to assess the midflow, and thus small airways disease will reduce your midflow, but many other factors will reduce your midflow, and so you have a wider distribution of values. And because of that, the same thing, if you go down to the lower limit of normal with the fifth percentile, you're somewhere around 65% uh, of predicted. Um, this means that if you apply that rule of 80% of predicted, you're over here, I mean, really close to actually one Z-score down. And so it means that um, you're basically just going to include a lot of people uh, that would maybe be normal. Um, and so that might be okay. I mean, I think the transplant physicians are saying that, well, you know, all we're interested in is, is being sensitive to pick up when something is going wrong. And if we have other people that maybe something isn't going wrong, we just are picking them up erroneously. And, and that's okay. But these days, there's actually newer technologies to measure small and large airways. Um, that, that would be a whole other, a whole other topic. But, um, but that, that's a possibility. But that's why we, we uh, recommended taking the mid flows off the off of your inter your normal interpretation of some rate of function testing. It's something that I got lots of emails about just from being in, in the middle.
little middle author on this guidelines <laughs> for my colleagues here. <laughs> um, so for, uh, the nice thing is that, you know, severity is also graded on the Z scores. And um, so this was one of the things previously severity was based on percent of predicted, which is like, again, sort of like reinforcing that percent of predicted is, you know, like the thing that you should look at. Now it's on Z-score, but of course the thing is that if you're in this 25-year-old, it corresponds pretty well with mild, moderate, and severe. Um, we simplified it just to having these three categories, but as you get outside of that range, then using Z-scores to allow you to know specifically how that lung function relates to population norms, you can see there's a pretty big shift um, in severity based on z-scores from what would have been assessed based on percent of predicted, right? So those people that if they're, if you had graded them previously on percent of predicted, you might find quite a different, um, a different value. Um, the, the other thing is that in the old guidelines, the 2005 guidelines really had, um, uh, this idea that you were going to make a kind of clinical diagnosis and in the new guidelines, uh, uh, it's really based on the lower limit of normal, uh, not the severity and the, and the pattern. So one of the ways in which this was sort of validated that you should use these scores is just looking at uh, hazard ratios for all-cause mortality. And that, of course, goes up quite, quite nicely just along with his Z-scores. That's not true if you do uh, percent percent predicted. All right, so I'm going to go on how you interpret your uh, your PFTs. Um, any questions from about using Z scores that are? So we could, we're going to start to see pulmonary function labs report things to us now as Z score. Yeah, yeah. I mean the the. Uh, in, in the fact that they're gonna report whether or not it's outside the bounds of normal, which yeah. allows you to look at the pattern and the severity should be based on Z scores. I've been working to try to convert, uh, even though I'm only the director of Montlake, the Montlake PFT lab, that's where most of our PFTs are done. Uh, I'm trying to get this to be across our entire system. And I think there is a, uh, I would have thought once we wrote that, like everyone would just immediately change over. But even getting our software updated to, to the new guidelines, yeah. it turns out to be rather challenging. So, uh, but the reports will will have it's sort of like a, a DEXA scan where they have the raw data, yeah, and, and all the other interpretations. But then you can fast forward to the bottom line. Yeah, you'd know, be able to it's... report it out, like you got the Z score for yourself, and and get a pretty good. And it's like literally just a Z score for the, I mean, it's pretty simple if yeah. you had a little, a little tab, but I, I would have to say our, our uh, software is not kicking out that, that interpretation right off the bat yet. And I can't like go in there and like change like <laughs> the proprietary software to do that. We've been working with them though. Well, variables about the patient, I mean, obviously age, sex, and race. Yeah. And maybe you'll get to race is like yeah. how many races there yeah. are. Okay. One <laughs> has to deal with it. But, yeah. Let me, uh, let me try to take you through that quickly so we get to the issue of race. Uh, um, so, you know, basically you have three different things that you're looking for. Um, the first is on the spirometry, looking for airflow obstruction. The second is looking restriction which is hinged on the TLC and then gas transfer impairment. Um, so uh, this is why I wanted to use my computer so we can animate it a little bit. So um, if you're, uh, your your FEV1 to FEC is above the fifth percentile, yes, so normal and your vital capacity is normal, then you have normal spirometry and we're done. And so again, that's based on the lower limit of normal, not, not based on you know, a fixed ratio or a percentage of a fixed ratio, et cetera. Uh, and that gives you uh, a really quick way of looking at that. Um, so if you're uh, below the fifth percentile um, and you have a vital capacity that's normal, so that means airflow obstruction, but your vital capacity is normal, then you have airflow obstruction. 
right? So I, Steve is already perplexed by this because there's people that have uh, abnormal ratio but have a normal vital capacity. And actually the old guidelines would suggest that that person has airflow obstruction um, in the 2005 guidelines, but is widely, uh, uh, <laughs> it's, it, it, there seems to be an area of controversy, like your vital capacity is normal, even if you have airflow obstruction, that it's normal somehow, right? Right. That way you're looking how about that. how about like in a given person who yeah. you're monitoring and treating and looking for a, a change? I mean, isn't it possible that they could be, you know, abnormal and then they are normal, but they're not optimized yet and they still have symptoms and, and then or or how does or, yeah. or you should at that point no longer use spirometry as the indicator? Yeah, exactly. That was one of the reasons why we said that we should separate the physiological pattern from the clinical diagnosis. You don't have to make them that perfect lung function, just to treat them clinically once they're in the normal range. Yeah, right. You're thinking as a clinician, and this is just uh, just your pulmonary function. Right. So it means that maybe you had airflow obstruction, a baseline, you got treated, that went away. It's optimal, obviously. So the way that this really gets in is that some people with large lungs, <laughs> when your vital capacity is large, you, have, uh, you can have a low ratio just because you've got large lungs. And there, as long as your met, the new metrics we use for risk, for air trapping are normal, then that's just normal. And it's called dis, dyssynapsis. You just grow big, and then your ratio is low, essentially. So, but if you if you have uh, no evidence of airflow obstruction, your vital capacity is uh, below the, the fifth percentile. You don't really know then what you have, you have to move on to lung function, uh, different lung function studies, but you might have restriction, you just don't know, uh, because gas trapping can cause that same finding. Um, <clears throat> the same thing is true if you have airflow obstruction and your vital capacity is low, it's possible that you have obstruction and restriction, but again, you don't know because gas trapping uh, can cause that same uh, pattern. And so in those cases, you need to move on to another test, which is lung volumes. <clears throat> so uh, with your total lung capacity then, if your total lung capacity is below the fifth percentile, you're outside of the range, then no matter what, you have restriction. Um, we then, uh, in the old guidelines, there is a number of other metrics, right? Residual volume being 150%. Uh, predicted your FRC being, uh, I think, 120% of predicted. It's now based on the ratio, and that basically allows it to be normalized to your lung capacity. And so if either of these, your FRC or your RV, and I realize, so I'm not talking to pulmonary, so your FRC is simply the resting position of the lung, and it shifts up. Um, in some cases, especially if you have uh, a problem with the elastic recoil of your lungs, such as COPD, for example. Residual volume is the same thing. If you destroy a part of the lung, um, also typically in COPD, but also in, uh, uh, that's been described in some people with asthma as well. Um, so, but if you don't have these measures of um, uh, air trapping, uh, which is much simpler, right? It's just these two measures, and they, they're always together. Um, then you have a simple restriction. But if you do have air trapping, uh, then you look back to see whether or not you have uh, airflow obstruction uh, again. And if so, then you know that you have a mixed disorder. Um, so you have airflow obstruction and you have restriction. Um, if that's not the case, um, that you just have uh, restriction, you have air trapping, but there's no airflow obstruction. We simply call that complex restriction. It's really a category that is no longer um, give, giving you a, a specific diagnosis. And that's based on, again, population statistics, which just show that these patterns occur. Um, so, so if you're above the, the fifth percentile, you have a normal, uh, well, you're, you're above the lower bound, and then you're not above the upper bound, 
and you don't have air trapping, then you have normal lung volumes. Um, but if you do have air trapping, even being within the normal bounds, then you have hyperinflation. Um, and this is something that you would have never picked up on before, right? Because these ratios, these, if, if you did this individually without looking at the associated total lung capacity, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that. So if you're above the 95th percentile in your total lung volume, this is where that dyssynapsis and so forth comes in. But you might be hyperinflated. Um, but if you're not hyperinflated, then you just have normal, normal large lungs, which is true of many people that worked out a lot you know, when they were still developing lung units, which is in your teenage years. Um, so if you work out a lot, some of those people have large lungs and that can be totally normal. But in this case, then we can look for hyperinflation specifically uh, within that, uh, with, even within someone who has a normal total lung capacity. All right, the last one is the DLCO. And this has been uh, something that I, I would have to say, you know, maybe as allergists, you're not looking at this as much. Um, as pulmonologists, we're looking at this. When the, the reference ranges change, it really changed the interpretation of DLCO in a large number of people, which um, uh, created a certain amount of, of problem. But basically, uh, the first thing to know is that you actually measure these things, the KCO, in the alveolar volume. So the KCO is simply the transfer of carbon monoxide, the rate at which it's transferred in the alveolar volume based on gas dilution. So that's different than we normally measure total lung capacity based on another metric called plethysmography. Um, so in the first case, if your DLCO is above the 95th percentile, that means that you've got too many red blood cells in the lung. And so that can be, uh, if you're hemorrhaging into the lung, you have too many red blood cells in your circulation or increasing blood flow. So uh, a shunt, in which is taking more of your blood volume through the lungs, um, all right? So if, you, uh, if your DLCO is abnormal, it's below that, um, that bound, then you look at your lung volumes. And if your lung volumes are normal, um, then uh, you're typically looking at a pulmonary vascular abnormality because the lung volumes are typically not normal in many of the other diseases in which we were wondering about a low DLCO. Um, this happens um, like if you have pulmonary hypertension, but this can also happen in those people that have uh, yeah, emphysema with reserved lung volumes. So the the you know, a significant portion of people with emphysema have a common risk factor for developing interstitial lung disease. And so those people actually, if you don't do these more complex tests, if you just do spirometry, you'll often miss the fact that they have really severely abnormal lung function um, because their vital capacity is often within the normal range, even if they're severely abnormal. And anemia, although we still, we still have a correction for anemia. Um, and so that would then correct back to, to normal. So if your alveolar volume is low, then you're meant to look at the KCO. And this is where, um, this is where the guideline really changed because I think a lot of people thought that you could correct away um, the, uh, if you have a low, low vital capacity, um, that you could kind of correct away that abnormality and say, well, the DLCO is normal for that, that, that loss of lung volume. And really, the, the only way that that actually works is if it's high. If the KCO is high, that is, in fact, um, uh, reflects that part of the lung is getting too much blood flow, essentially. So if you, like, take out a lung or collapse one lung, the other lung has a lot of blood flow and your KCO will be high. And that's because essentially the dead space to the amount of lung, it gives you a high KCO. And so it, by flipping it around, we, we are hopefully minimizing that idea that uh, in the setting of a you know, low lung volume that you can kind of correct away a DLCO that's low, okay? And so that's basically giving you the physiological pattern 
Um, the, the, the one thing I would say is that oftentimes you get this idea that, um, you know, so if you have mixed obstruction and restriction, you can, you can parse it out. Like that person has, you know, asthma and well, their lung, their airflow obstruction is mild, but they have restriction. And I like to interpret things that way as well. Um, but that's not how you interpret their lung function. It's just based on these bounds. Um, so you don't, you don't separate it out when you're interpreting it. All right, any questions about that? I know we changed too many things here, so uh, I'm trying to get to a race here as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here to interpret the pulmonary function test going forward. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll try my best. There was, uh, yeah, I, the thing is, is like, you know, our lab, you know, people, are, it's like 150 PFTs in a week, right? So our physicians need to be able to read these very quickly. You can tell there's an algorithm there that should just kick that off the computer, um, but it doesn't right now. And I'm trying to trying to change that so that we can uh, get these accurately read. So the other big thing is the assessment of bronchodilator response. I bet you do this in clinic all the time. So yeah. Um, so the thing is, is that people do this to look for a. Uh, um, uh, uh, asthma essentially, but that's not what it shows in the current, in the prior guidelines. Uh, and that's because bronchodilator response is strongly related to your baseline lung function. So um, the in the old guidelines, it was the percent of your baseline. So if your baseline is, is uh, for example, 65% of predicted, I know I'm using percent of predicted, you're a lot more likely to have a bronchodilator response just because you start with this lower lower lung function and you can make a 12% change from there. And um, this is just showing this graphically that um, if your baseline lung function is low, you're a lot more likely to have a change in your percent down here as your lung function gets lower. Um, if you simply give a fixed amount uh, the change in FEV1 uh, in liters rather than percent, uh, it, it takes away quite a lot of that um, variability. And uh, so this is, um, you know, what the data shows is that uh, upwards of 50 to 60 percent of people with COPD have a positive bronchodilator response. Uh, if you look at the people with asthma, three to 12% or so will have a positive bronchodilator response. And so by the old guideline. Um, so in general, what you're looking for with that sort of, let, let's see if they have asthma, they have a bronchodilator response, you're almost never getting. And so we changed the definition <laughs> uh, in the absence of um, population-based standards. So the old guidelines, 12% of baseline, the new guidelines, 10% of the predicted value. So you're taking away the lung function bias and you're making it 10%. This was based on essentially an expert opinion um, based on that. The ideal thing, of course, and there is actually now a paper where they looked at uh, bronchodilator responses in different categories of lung function with that idea that you could also do a regression equation, you know, to look at what your bronchodilator response should be if you've got normal lung function, what should it be if you've got abnormal lung function. And that, that's where this is headed. So this is, I would say, an interim, uh, uh, an interim guideline, all right? So 10% of the predicted. Uh, if you do that in clinic, that's the way it's interpreted. Any questions about that? Heresy. Just if we go back two <laughs> slides to seem just the opposite of what we think of as clinicians. That COPD has reversibility, asthma doesn't. Right. It's just counterintuitive to what all of us think uh, and the way we've all been taught. Yeah, I think, I think you said that backwards, but uh, that people have been taught that COPD has no reversibility right. and asthma has reversibility. Yes, it's absolutely the opposite of that. But it's because of that bias that you have uh, lung function, um, it's such a big lung function bias. This may be the next level, but it, it, is the FDA kind of respectful of that with like with with pivotal trial 
inclusion criteria and whatnot. Because I mean, I, in, in our asthma studies, we turned away at least 90% of the asthmatics that came in for an asthma trial <laughs> because they didn't have this barometry criteria. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the next level of that, of that, you know, in one of the pivotal trials of uh, budesonide in kids, they did both a bronchoprovocation test and a bronchodilator test. And 12% had a positive bronchodilator response. To get in the trial, they had to have one or the other. So most of them had a positive uh, bronchoprovocation test, but um, it's extraordinarily common. If you do a nonspecific test, by the way, for a bronchoprovocation test, like a methacholine challenge, you face the same issue. If you do, if you have 65% the lower lung function starting. and you do a methacholine challenge, it's almost certainly positive. And even though you were told that that's like, oh, that person has asthma, um, that same bias. That's why that's why you're supposed to interpret bronchoprovocation tests with the pretest probability. So you have what their clinical probability of asthma and then the bronchoprovocation test. And that's not true for the indirect challenge tests, like mannitol and exercise and so forth. All right. Well, this is a super complex area. I'll try to give you the 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 uh, that are plus and, and minus. So there's a lot of press about this, about race. And part of that has to do with the fact that um, the statistics show this, that there's a, a different trajectory in these four groups. And you, you can tell that this was not pre-specified, right? So we weren't, look, uh, we weren't looking at lung function tests in one group. You'll, you'll notice there's only four groups and two of them are Asian groups, right? So it was simply the way the data um, fell out. Um, but you can see what the, the, it's basically the peak lung function is where the, where the total difference is. And then um, the trajectory from there is about the same. And so lung function is determined by age, height, either sitting or standing height. There's some controversy there. Um, that uh, sitting height might give you a slightly more accurate um, sex, rate, ethnicity, and socioeconomic factors. Um, so, you know, the, the reality is that lung function is related to social determinants of health. Um, this is things like early nutrition, childhood infections, air pollution. Here's the classic Goderman study showing that if you go from a cohort where there was horrible air pollution down in uh, the LA basin to less air pollution, although a lot of air pollution down there, lung function continues continually gets better, uh, the portion that are below 80% and so forth. Um, so air pollution exposure, tobacco smoke exposure, low birth weight, maternal exposures, and socioeconomic status. So those are very closely related to what your lung function is. And, and the thing about it is um, the, you know, essentially the structure in, a, in our society and many others um, facilitates race being collinear with these determinants of lung function. Um, and just to kind of, I had this, you know, oftentimes there are people that will hold uh, quite strongly to the idea that there are, um, differences, make differences related to your, your ancestry, but um, none of these studies really look specifically at genetic ancestry for the most part. And this is one of the studies that did, this was in the New England Journal, and they asked people at the beginning, it was only done in people that self-identified as African-American, right? And so you can see how much of a social determinant that is, because there's this big tail here when they measured African genes, right? So the portion of African genes, these people that self-identified as African-American, there's a fair bit of heterogeneity. And so it really is a social construct. Um, but, and, and this study didn't adjust for those social factors, right? So if you're perceived as being black, you might have a different set of exposures and, and or opportunities, unfortunately. Um, but they did show that the percent of African ancestry within that group was related to lung function. But you can see that the, the 
the delta in lung function is not very not very big, and uh, and they didn't do any adjustment um, for those socioeconomic factors. So this has been I'll just kind of skip through this briefly, but many people, starting with Thomas Jefferson, before lung function studies were available suggested that African Americans had a problem with their pulmonary apparatus. And in a series of you know studies, John Hutchinson, not really uh, re relating things to race, he actually showed that it was related to occupation, not lung function. He was one of the first people that used the uh, spirometer and developed it. But then uh, this guy Samuel Cartwright, who is a physician plantation physician, really further um, made this note that uh, uh, African Americans were deficient in pulmonary function, but they didn't do any really adjustment uh, at all um, for height or age, right? So um, so th this difference was not, um, not, not very rigorous uh, in that respect. And then interestingly enough, at the end of the, um, this data has then subsequently been used, some of these older data, to further, um, uh, for example, uh, claims about fitness um, for uh, life insurance uh, was basically based on this flawed data. And so I would say, you know, the, the main thing is that uh, the attribution to this being an innate difference, there's like almost no evidence, right? This is the, what the evidence is, is that these differences are related to the structure of our society. Um, and, uh, and they should be attributed to that. However, um, I'm just gonna switch. The, the, the problem is, is that it's not simple. Uh, if you decide that you're going to use race specific equations, which in general normalize lower lung function if you're African American or any non uh, white race, essentially you could have a delayed diagnosis, you might not get treated early, you might not recognize, you might normalize that abnormal lung function. And that could also reduce access to you know, disability, homelessness, ventilation, and so forth. If you ignore those race-specific uh, equations in general, uh, you'll lower the average lung function um, while increasing the distribution, right? So if you go to a kind of non-overly non Caucasian approach, and this also could lead to overdiagnosis and unnecessary testing, which could lead to treatment side effects, anxiety, uh, in ineligibility for some occupations, potentially even, you know, differences in who you decide is eligible for chemotherapy and transplants and cancer resections and so forth. So it's not a simple, not a simple issue. Um, so what I would say is that I think the ultimate thing to do is simply to be aware of these differences. So whether or not you decide to use the GLI race corrections that which are there, or not, um, you still need to be able to think about whether or not this is really normal for this person or not in the, in the situation that they're in. But in addition to that, there's now the GLI global reference set. And this was basically, they took the data and they tried to weight, um, weight the, the different races, weights for the different race groups. And the idea behind this is that you could apply a single reference range across everyone. Um, and that's called, that's not the GLI other. Um, the GLI other has a small amount of data. So if you, if you go to your computer and use the Global Lung Initiative, and there's white, uh, North Asians, South Asians, and African Americans, essentially. And then there's another category which says GLI other. There's not very much data in that. This is a different thing, and you probably would have to get this loaded onto it. it was, it's in the article describing this is actually still in print, um, but it's using a weighted uh, reference range, and it would be the the first time that I would say I would be comfortable potentially putting a single reference range uh, if you want to use it. Um, the the problem is like the manufacturer we have. If you're gonna set, like, I'd like to look at this in GLI Global, or I'd like to look at this in GLI uh, 
with the different uh, ethnic groups, which is what the guidelines say. Um, you do that in the software, like where the technician is starting the test. It's not like in the interpretation part of it, um, at least not with our software. Um, so it seems like it would have to be one or the other. And uh, that's something I've been trying to decide what we do at the, at the university. So, um, all right. So I just a summary that you should use pop population-based statistics that allow you to understand whether or not you have the right answer or not. Um, use the upper and lower limits. Uh, Z-scores and percentiles are used to identify those limits. Um, you, should, you shouldn't use the percent of predicted. Uh, you should change the interpretation of your bronchodilator response. You should be uh, sensitive to uh, socioeconomic and social factors. So that's what I brought for you. <laughs> so, Tio, I'm curious when you're in committees, particularly the last issue of race, was that a politically charged issue? Um, how is that handled in our society? I mean, these kind of issues come up when you can't discuss race or. I'm just curious from a yeah. I, well, I think the the main thing that you should the main typical message is that attributing uh, differences to some sort of innate difference is is definitely the, the worst the worst thing worst thing to do. And I that and you know it's a it's basically representing structural racism in our society. And so I think you're on on. Uh, but that's the way I guess that's it, that this is a structural problem in our society. Is that uh, now cactus would be independent of that, right? Yeah, because I know that that was a, a, a really common, it was very easy for patients with cactus to qualify for especially that is because yeah. it came in lower. Oh, I see. Um, I don't know if that's how what the distribution is. Wait, yeah, the, population. the one thing that people, the, the people that residually hold out to the idea that there, there are differences have that standing height versus sitting height metric, that maybe that's different in African Americans. But that in the GLI global, they actually looked at that difference based on standing height and sitting height. And there was a prior publication, which also did that. And so again, that's a misnomer of that. There's some black normal ratio and African miracles. Um, I know, of course, this is just a physiological assessment of interpretation of the lung function tests themselves. But of course, on the clinical side of things, that's why we get the test is to make some kind of clinical application of them. Given your you know, expertise in asthma, how do you see this kind of physiological assessment of lung function, and how is that going to be filtered into the diagnostic criteria for asthma? Very great question. <laughs> I promise not to play it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, one of the confusing things for me, uh, if you want to, that, that I've always, uh, you know, mo most people with lung, with asthma, like in some series, like 70% of or so will have relatively normal lung function. And so, um, but uh, in some series, in the majority of series, so that would suggest that most people have normal-ish lung function. So you think that they all have mild asthma. But then if you look at the distribution of mild, moderate, and severe, a lot more people than 30% are shifted into these other categories. And that has to do with the, the way the guidelines have evolved over time that like if you continue to have symptoms, continue to have symptoms, you get upclassified, right? But uh, like Steve was sort of pointing out on like, you know, how you enroll someone, the studies that validate many of the approaches to therapy all had a fixed cutoff. Like we're studying people that had 65 to 80% of predicted lung function and we're going to use ICS lava therapy. And so, yeah, that worked great. So when you apply that to like, say someone who physiologically has normal lung function, I don't think you necessarily should expect the same outcome that you that you would get. And so it, this to me is an intractable thing with the guidelines and how people are classified. Um, I don't know what the right answer is, but yeah, the, the, um, 
the physiology, uh, I'm not sure that I'm really answering your question. It's just like, you know, the physiology of, of someone who fundamentally has normalish lung function is different to me as someone who's seen lots of people with asthma than those people who have reduced lung function. And, and you know, someone who has normal lung function has a lot of symptoms. That's completely different to me than someone who has low lung function and has a lot of symptoms. And that is not in any way shown in the guidelines. Well, that actually, that's the point. Is yeah. this going to lead to a complete reevaluation of how ASL guidelines are written? Yeah, I would I would think so. Again, I don't know that I don't know that there's a simple way to make that assessment, but I think that somehow your baseline lung function should factor in to how you're classified and it really isn't. It's class because you get up classified and they, if you persistently have symptoms. And so oh, it's interesting though, because it seems <clears throat> the original ones, it was FED1. It, it was, yes. yes. There was it, no, it, and then it's, it's like, more, you just use your common sense and crank. Right. It's like, well, they're doing fine <laughs> or not. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then they changed it to, they changed to well-controlled to, and not well-controlled. Right. Based on Control was the main thing. So if you're not well-controlled, but we all have patients, uh, I'm sure you have them too. Like I remember taking over <clears throat> when Ed McCone left, one of his steroid dependent asthma patients who had completely normal lung function. And I just, I, I subsequently took them off of everything and they were still all normal. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure that you all have. Oh, yeah, that's what was the wrong diagnosis. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. And yeah. that person had just had uh, vocal, what used to be well, called vocal cord dys dysfunction. So, have we changed that name too? <laughs> yes, we did. Uh -oh. Well, they said officially idiopathic laryngeal obstruction or, yeah. or, or, yeah. or invisible yeah. laryngeal, laryngeal obstruction because there's also patients yeah. that localize it there, but it's not obstructive. <laughs> right. Heal, thank you. There's no name for that yet. <laughs> uh, parking meter started at eight o'clock. I gotta go. <laughs>